I want to present some data from the work that um, I've been doing. I'm just before I get to talking about the title, I'm just going to um, add a, uh, a bit of a, a summary and, and tell you where we are. A lot of the work that I'm doing is connected into the PIPS program, um, and there are a number of us that are involved in the PIPS program here, but also and various other sites in Australia and, and New Zealand. So my, ty my PhD is going to concentrate on, on how changes in canopy management and environment affect resource allocation in Apple. And the work that I'm going to present um, today is particularly on, on Gala Apple, and it's going to um, look at specifically fruit set of gala, which is, from both a horticultural and a physiological point of view, one of the important areas in resource allocation in, in Apple. I'll be talking a bit about artificial spur extinction as well, which is the form of canopy management that we've um, decided to use. A bit of an introduction. The floral behavior of apple trees, certainly in commercial, um, and modern production systems is such that they produce many flowers and many fruit uh, far in excess of what is required for commercial production or com the production of high quality fruit. And in fact, on, in a normal production system, uh, dwarf apple trees produce in excess of 350 flower buds in mature trees, which equates to around about 2,000 flowers. And in, in addition to this, in, in uh, regions and, and genotypes where uh, flowering occurs on one-year-old wood, there can be an, an additional 1,000 flowers produced on a tree. So we end up with a situation where we have 3,000 flowers on a tree. We only require 250 or 200 fruit on each tree. Um, a big load on the tree for the number of fruit that are ultimately going to be harvested from that um, tree. So the conventional solution to this, chemical and hand thinning. Chemical thinning starts at, uh, at flowering um, and eventually ends up in, in hand thinning, which is, uh, can be two, three months after uh, flowering. And if we consider that um, the whole season in, in uh, short season varieties may only be four or five months, you can see that at least um, a third, possibly even half of the season has, has passed us by before the final fruit set, or final, final crop loads are set on those trees. The, um, the, other, the problem with chemical thinning is that the results are unpredictable. There's, there's no problem with the chemistry, but when applying it to a biological system, there are all sorts of things that that can go wrong, and if you add the human factor to it, uh, concentrations, spray coverage, and that kind of thing, um, it becomes more unpredictable. We lose potential in fruit size because of the delay in, in reducing those fruit numbers, and one of the other um, points is that all of this uh, floral load on the trees and, and early fruit development, um, the delay in reducing those numbers can induce alternate or buying or bearing in uh, some genotypes. And certainly from a, from a commercial point of view, that's, that's unacceptable. From a physiological point of view, it's quite interesting because it gives us some, some tools to work with. So if we just hold that idea on, on the side for a moment, and, and I just want to talk about spur extinction. Um, this is a phenomenon that um, some colleagues in France have described pierre Lowry and, and a number of other folk. And it's a natural phenomenon that's observed in some genotypes. And what happens is that some buds, and they're usually the floral buds, uh, die off naturally and completely. The remaining buds produce shoots that become floral in the following season. And so what happens is that you get reiterative floral um, production on some shoots. Interestingly, this 
natural phenomenon, this blood extinction phenomenon, corresponds very closely to those cultivars that are least susceptible to biennial berry, which, um, as I said, from a physiological point of view, biennial bearing is quite interesting. And the question um, that we've asked ourselves in the PIPS program that I want to investigate further in, in the PhD is can we impose this natural phenomenon, can we impose it artificially to alter, in the results I'm going to be presenting today, fruit set, but can we use this phenomenon to alter a number of other things in, in the tree and hence the canopy management part of the work that I'll be doing. So artificial spur extinction, what we do from a practical um, sense is that on each limb in the tree, according to its size, and we measure the size using the basal cross-sectional area of that limb, so according to the size of the, of the limb, we remove um, buds, selecting those buds that are uh, present in the right positions and the right type, and they are also floral, hence the F there. Um, so we end up with a certain bud density on a tree related to the size of and number of branches in the tree. Axillary um, buds are removed completely apart from a few that we, we use, um, that we leave for um, subsequent replacement growth if necessary. And so we end up with a situation where a tree that's undergone spur extinction at the top uh, looks quite a lot less dense than a conventional tree, which we see at the bottom. So the objectives of this section of, of work was to look at two things. Firstly, on the floral, terminal, and spur buds, we wanted to try and quantify the effect of genotype and environment, firstly, on natural fruit set, and secondly, we wanted to look at the effect of artificial spur extinction on um, a fruit set. And in this case, the genotypes that I'm looking at, five genotypes across the PhD, the results I'll be presenting are just on one of those genotypes. And by environment, we have five different regions, three in Australia, here, Victoria and um, Queensland, two in, two in New Zealand. They're all commercial orchards, so there's some, um, we've confined it slightly by the fact that they're all commercial production centers, um, some different uh, rootstocks, and I'll be looking at a number of different seasons. So that's the environment side of things. So firstly, looking at the effects on, on natural fruit set, and secondly, um, the effect of spur extinction. So here we have um, some of the results, uh, four different regions, um, and we're looking at the proportion of um, floral buds, or buds that flowered, and comparing it with the number of fruit that was set up in those floral buds. So for example, in Nelson, um, of, the, of the buds that flowered, around about 10% failed to subsequently produce any fruit. Um, around about 30% produced either one or two fruit per, per bud, and the remainder produced multiple fruits. If you look at um, all four regions, fairly similar results. Uh, in all cases, the, the buds that fail to set fruit at all, the zeros, were all less than those that were set up a single fruit. In some cases, um, those that set up singles and doubles were fairly similar, Nelson and Tasmania. But in most cases, then, those that set up multiple fruit per, per, um, um, per bud declined as the, the, as the number of fruit in, increased in those in those buds. So you would have to, by looking at that, you would have to, I guess, conclude that environment plays a very, very little role in this whole thing. However, and of course there's always got to be a, a however, and in our case it's Queensland, 
in Queensland, very different story um, is exposed. In Queensland, over 50% in, in, well, in this case, just, just over 50% of buds that flowered failed to produce any fruit. And then the declines um, after that. Now, we, we need to try and understand why that, why that is the case. It seems that in Queensland, the, um, it's the only site that has a hail netting, permanent hail netting structure over the, over the trees right down to the ground. And it seems that in this case, pollination may well have played a, a, a role, or lack of pollination may have played a role. Um, we also know that we know th um, that bee activity is often limited under hail netting, and the availability of pollen seemed also to be limiting in this particular case. So you'd have to then conclude that environment does play a role, but maybe there are opportunities to explain how that environment plays a role. So that's natural fruit set. If we look at now fruit set response in, in, as fruit set in response to spur extinction, we, we've seen this um, graph. It's one of the ones I've just presented before, Hawke's Bay. Um, and this, this is natural fruit um, set at a spur and terminal density of, of um, 8.6 buds, a further 0.7 buds per square centimeter of axillaries, total floral bud load of around about nine, just over nine buds. If artificially we remove all of these axillaries and reduce the spurs and, spurs and terminals to five, we, this is the response that we got. The number of buds failing to set fruit declined. There's also a, 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 a change here. The number of setting ones also declined. And the, one, and the buds setting multiple fruit increased. If we further reduce the spur extinction, if we further reduce the floral bud load um, by applying spur extinction at a level of three, the response is um, further shifted to multiple fruit per bud. That was Hawke's Bay, Gala. If we look at one of the other sites in Victoria, um, similar responses. Um, uh, spur extinction or reducing the bud load reduces the number, the proportion of um, buds setting zero fruit. There's a bit of noise here around, around those setting one and then multiple fruit as bud extinction increases. And that's quite useful because it means that there's possibly an opportunity here to, see, to look at some modeling. Firstly, around the relationship between um, floral bud density and those buds failing to produce fruit. And secondly, the relationship between um, floral bud density and buds um, setting fruit, in particular those buds setting multiple fruit. I seem to have lost the um, cursor. And the, the relationship may look a little bit like this. This is the same data presented slightly differently, and it's the proportion of floral buds setting multiple fruit. So just the, the right-hand side of those histograms I was, part, I was, I was um, describing. And there may be a relationship here, particularly if we understand a little bit more about it. The triangles and diamonds down here are all one rootstock. Different regions, two different regions, but one one rootstock, Victoria and Queensland. The others, and they, they are a slightly more vigorous rootstock than the others, which are all d dwarfing rootstocks. It also looks like Hawke's Bay and Tasmania, the, the, the squares and the crosses are fairly closely related, but there's something slightly different going on in, in um, Nelson. So just in, in conclusion then, um, it seems that natural fruit set patterns are in fact uh, affected by environment, but th there may be ways of, try of explaining that relationship. Secondly, reducing floral bud density using spur extinction methods. Firstly, reduces the proportion of buds that fail to set. 
and secondly, increases the proportion of buds that set fruit, particularly those setting multiple fruit. And that may allow us to develop some predictive models around um, fruit to set response. We're going to continue this work over a number of um, years and hopefully get a, a better idea of how that works. And that may be particularly useful for growers in a commercial um, sense. And that's it. Um, in a wild tree, well, wild trees are huge structures. Um, I would be taking a guess at um, uh, a thousand fruit, probably the size, that kind of size. Um, sorry, say that. Um, well, c commercial um, commercial production in, in commercial production, trees have have shifted slightly differently. They're, they're, they're very precocious, um, so they flower early in their life. They produce many flowers, probably many more than uh, the density is probably a lot higher than than wild types, and so you you probably end up with similar numbers of of fruit, um, but again, probably all that size. 